Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for coming out this Memorial Day weekend Sunday. And we are thankful to have Michael Mena playing for the organ for our dance again this week. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff is still uh, experiencing some uh, physical difficulties. Hopes to be with us next week, but we'll see how he feels. So thank you again, Michael.
The uh, gospel lesson is taken from Luke chapter 24. The, the lectionary that I'm using, the reading, scripture readings I'm using today are those from uh, for the Ascension, uh, which was just a few days ago, Ascension, day of the Ascension, a couple of days ago. So this reading is taken from Jesus' words uh, at, at, on the evening of Easter to the disciples. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, Jesus lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. They were, then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the table, at the temple, Praising God. Here ends the reading from the Gospel according to Luke. And uh, Jim will share with you the next lesson from the Acts of the Apostles. Luke is the author of two books in the Bible, the Gospel, which we just heard, and the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. In my former book, Luke wrote, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion when he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates. The father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing there looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here is our reading. The last scripture reading that I will use for today is from Ephesians chapter 1. These are words of Paul to the early church at Ephesus, uh, in what is now modern-day Turkey, but also to us of this place as the living word of God. Paul wrote, I keep asking God that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed Christ to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. 
here in Mississippi. I invite you now to uh, pray with me the prayer for Ascension, uh, the Ascension Day, uh, which is found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Our living God, your eternal Christ once dwelt on earth, confined by time and space. Give us faith to discern in every time and place the presence among us of him who is head over all things and fills all, even Jesus Christ, our ascended Lord. Amen. In celebration of the Ascension, I invite you to stand and sing with me that Easter Ascension hymn, Hail the Day that Seats and Rise, number 312 in the hymnal, as well as on the screen. Devin Mass school shooting. 
this time one that left ten, two beautiful teachers and 19 beautiful children dead and many others wounded physically and or psychologically. And how is it that evil too often reigns even in Christ's church of what she is called the head with child sexual abuse, sexual scandals among adults, gossiping, conspiracy theories spread, petty and not so, uh, not so petty internal conflicts, and the like that we see in the modern church today. Perhaps it's easiest to begin by saying how Christ does not reign and how his kingdom does not come. First of all, Christ's kingdom does not come here on earth by the amassing and the use of political power to achieve political ends, even those undertaken for religious reasons or with a ra religious rationale behind them. Jesus never told his followers to oppose Rome's power by political action or rebellion. Instead, Jesus expected his followers to be his witnesses and to talk about all that he had said and done. Christ's message, as summarized by Matthew and Mark's gospel, was in the beginning, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And friends, the kingdom of heaven was near to people in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son, sent from heaven to earth to take on flesh and humanity so that he could die for our sins on the cross as the perfect sacrifice. The good news of the kingdom that Jesus preached was that we could all be forgiven our sins by grace through faith in him as our Lord and Savior and the Messiah. Truly, Jesus did not come to tell us to form political parties and claim that they, could somehow, in, that they somehow embody God's truth. Instead, Jesus declared, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Neither we nor this culture will be saved by any political party or politician, and certainly not by anyone of any party claiming to have all the answers to everything, yet teaching things contrary to the gospel and acting in ways and using tactics that are evil and untruthful. That is not to say that we as Christians should not work and vote in ways that we believe promote the things that Jesus taught, like protecting the poor and the vulnerable and fighting injustice. Indeed, we should. But let's not think that Christ's kingdom will come here on earth by political means and actions. It hasn't already in the past 2,000 plus years, and it will never do so by those tainted human beings. Nor will Christ's kingdom come by military might. Even after his resurrection from the dead, it seems that Jesus' disciples were still expecting that somehow as the risen Messiah, Jesus would restore Israel's political and military independence and bring in a time of national power and glory like Israel had enjoyed during, during the reign of the great King David. In fact, as Jim read, Luke tells us, uh, or as I read, uh, no, I think uh, as Jim read, excuse me, Luke tells us that just before Christ's physical ascension into heaven, his disciples asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They were wondering and hoping that it was the time when the, the, the power and the, and, the, and the people of pagan imperial Rome would be kicked out of the Holy Land for good forever. Surely with Jesus as the Messiah raised from the dead, this, this would have been possible. But that was not to be, because the kind of kingdom that Jesus was bringing in would not be one just for the Jews, but a heavenly people, a heavenly kingdom for people of all races and nations. And Jesus would not bring in that kingdom by military means. Why? Because Christ's kingdom is to be a spiritual kingdom. Not an earthly military or political kingdom. That's why Jesus, in responding and talk, talk to, in responding to his disciples, talked to them about receiving spiritual power with the baptism of the Holy Spirit that would enable them to more boldly and, and effectively spread the spiritual message, the gospel that Jesus wanted them to share, and that Jesus wants us to share. 
That's why Jesus said, it is not for you to know the time or the periods the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And there is a, a, a passage where, where, where Jesus said that the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. You see, Jesus had more important things on his mind and on his agenda than defeating Rome. He was here to defeat Satan and the forces of death and evil. Furthermore, Christ's disciples were not to share the good news of the gospel at the point of a sword. There are to be no forced conversions to the Christian faith. There is nothing in the New Testament at all that supports that. And when the Christian church and for its members have engaged in that kind of coercive, violent activity, it has been in violation of both Christ's spirit and his teaching. Likewise, there is to be no revolution to take back any country for Christ or any such nonsense. Jesus told his followers to be willing to die to spread his message of salvation, not to be willing to kill for it. The kind of power that Jesus wants us to wield is the power of healing, forgiving, creative love, not the kind of power that a gun gives to threaten and kill and destroy. You may remember that just before he was arrested, Jesus asked his, his disciples, When I sent you out without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? And they replied, Nothing. And then he said to them, But now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Yet when the eleven disciples said, Lord, here are two swords, Jesus said, That's enough. But it's more telling that immediately after that exchange, Luke's Gospel tells us that when the disciples saw that Jesus, that Judas had arrived and was going to betray Jesus, they, and, and he was going to be in him, it was, his arrest was imminent, they asked him, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And then without waiting for Jesus' answer, Peter cut off the high priest's servant's ear with his sword. Only to hear Jesus quickly and I will be sharply declare, no more of this. Put your sword away. And he immediately healed the servant's ear. John's Gospel records that Jesus also told Peter, shall I put your sword away, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? More critically, to support my assertion that God's kingdom will not come by earthly military power is Christ's response to Peter's violence as reported in Matthew's Gospel. There we, we hear Jesus say to Peter, Put back your sword in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think that I can call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? by which Jesus meant his death at the hands of Rome. Friends, when, when God's kingdom does come in all its fullness, as a new heaven on, on a new heaven and new earth, it will be as a result of the spiritual battle won by spiritual forces, not by way of any earthly political or military power or battles. Indeed, the picture that we get in the Revelation to John is one of Jesus leading all of God's angelic forces and defeating Satan and all his demonic forces in heaven and on earth with Christ's divine authority and power to exercise the wrath and the judgment of God. In the Revelation to John chapter 20, John the beloved disciple, the author of, I believe, that book as well as the Gospel of John and the three letters, describes the vision that he saw of the end of time his vision of Jesus like this. He said, I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, with justice 
He judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. That should remind us of John, the beginning of John's Gospel when he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we read farther, we'll know that, G, that, that John was referring to Jesus as the Word of God. So here it says, His name is the Word of God. Continuing, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Friends, in the rest of chapter 20, we can read about how Satan and all those who like him have rejected God in Christ, being defeated and consigned to a lake of fire to be tormented forever. Now, whether you interpret this vision literally or figuratively, the message is clear. Jesus as the Word of God, Jesus as the Lamb of God, will prevail over all the forces of evil and the devil, and in the end consign them to hell forever. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 21, we read about how, of God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And we also read about God dwelling with his people, wiping away every tear from their eyes, and about how the new heaven and the new earth is a place where there, where, where there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. But obviously, we are not in that time yet. The fullness of God's kingdom has not yet come. And in the meantime, Satan and his evil and demonic forces are still allowed to operate here on earth. Recall that Jesus said this about Satan as recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Satan must have rejoiced at the events in Novali this past week. But our God mourns yet another young man's murderous rampage. Clearly, the devil and his demonic forces are still at work making trouble here on earth. He still works to tempt people to reject God and his son Jesus Christ and to disobey God in many ways. Satan's ability to incite violence and chaos is all too evident in our world. So again, how is it that Christ our Lord rules when it seems like so much evil still exists in our fallen world? Friends, part of the answer is that God has given us as humans free will to accept Jesus or to reject him and the freedom to embrace evil or to do good. And God gave that same free will to the angelic spirits he, he, cre he created as eternal beings. While it is true that Christ Want, but while it is true that Christ wants to reign in our hearts and in our minds and in our world more broadly, he will not coerce either our belief or our obedience. We have to offer it to him freely. However, as you know, many do not. And we see the terrible results in our society. And we can't just blame it on those who haven't accepted Christ. We can't just blame the devil for our own failures to obey God's commandments or to try to restrain the evils of others. Moreover, it is important to understand that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew more frequently calls it, that Jesus so often talked about was a spiritual or a heavenly one. You see, again, Jesus did not talk about the kingdom of God as an earthly, political, military, or geographic entity, but as a spiritual one, which we enter through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. 
In chapter 3 of John's Gospel, for example, we hear Jesus tell Nicodemus, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. With these words, I believe Jesus was talking about spiritual rebirth through repentance and then believing in Jesus as our Savior as a requirement for entering the kingdom of God, for being part of the realm of God. In fact, Jesus said that, that, said that just moments before declaring these truths himself, about himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. They have not believed in Jesus. So my friends, it is my belief based on scripture that the kingdom of God or the rule of God grows and expands here as more on earth, as more and more people accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and seek to live in obedience to him. Remember that when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the, kind, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or a, a, a translation that we might be more familiar with is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Friends, the, the kingdom of God is within us because it's a spiritual kingdom or realm, again, that we enter through faith in Jesus as our Lord. That's why Jesus taught truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And, and I think that means that as, as children generally, per, generally depend on their parents to provide for them and trust in their parents to do so, that it is that kind of childlike faith and trust and dependence on God as our Heavenly Father and as Jesus, on uh, Jesus as our Savior, that is required of us to be entered into the kingdom of God. If we think we can earn or merit our way into the kingdom of God by our good works, even religious ones, we are badly mistaken. But if we believe in Jesus as our as the Son of God and as our Savior, we receive an entrance into the kingdom of God as a gift of God's grace and mercy. And then, as a result, try, we are to try to live out in obedience, live our lives in obedience to Christ's commands out of love and gratitude to God and to his son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Jesus, at the time of his trial, before Pilate confessed to him, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to protect my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is from another place. That is true because Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom of heavenly origin. Remember that, but also remember that Jesus once said when he, when he was confronted by critics after he had driven many demons out of a man, he said, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. My friends, the kingdom of God did come in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but we still await in these days the coming of that kingdom in all its fullness and glory. Christ does reign, but still encounters opposition. Therefore, in the meantime, we suffer the tragic consequences of living in a fallen world where so many people reject Jesus and where so many of us who claim to, to trust in Christ still sin and behave badly. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, 
The Apostle Paul wrote to early Christians to say this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The ruler of the kingdom of, air, of the air is a reference to Satan, who is still his, his influence, still at work in those who are disobedient. Nevertheless, my friends, part of the way that God rules or that Jesus Christ rules even today is in believers, in influencing us through his Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow him in obedience. But you may ask, does Christ or God work in the world beyond influencing individual hearts and minds? Personally, I believe that God does. Because the Bible speaks in many, many places of God as, a, as our God being a God in control of so much. So, so much. Even as he allows us as humans to have free will to follow or reject him. And the Bible talks about Jesus having power over those demonic spirit, spirits. How exactly Christ rules the church and the world under God's divine rule and authority in and through and despite the events of this violent and, and fallen and unjust world is ultimately a mystery that may or may not be revealed to us in heaven if by God's grace and mercy we arrive there one day or if we are raised from the dead to be able to enjoy the fullness of God's kingdom come in a new heaven and a new earth. At the end, in God's own timing, God and Christ's rule will be ultimately expressed and exercised in the utter defeat of the devil and death and all the forces of evil, all of which Christ defeated already on his, in his death on the cross, but all of which have not conceded their utter defeat. Nevertheless, as Jesus himself promised in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 through 43, at the end of the age, the Son of Man will, will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace there will, where there will be gnashing of teeth and the righteous will shine like the sun. The last book of, the, of Revelation, the last book of the Bible describes the final, their final battle against the forces of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Revelation 17, verse 14 says, says following, They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his call chosen, and faithful followers. At the final judgment, friends, Jesus will also rule by richly rewarding his followers and punishing those who are not. In conclusion, listen carefully to Jesus' words from Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, where he spoke to John about, to John in his vision. In that vision, Jesus said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those who are victorious, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice the magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the, to the fire lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And for your information, the lake of fire was where Revelation chapter 20 says the devil was thrown to be tormented forever and ever. My friends, Christ our Lord ultimately rules in peace for eternity after the defeat of Satan and death and 
all the forces of evil, both human and spiritual and systemic. In the meantime, as Christians, we are to do our best to love and to obey God and believe in Jesus and oppose, and oppose evil and injustice in all its forms and urge others to do the same while trusting that, we'll, that, that God in his justice and love will ultimately work everything out right in the end. Christ now reigns when we love others and serve them with the kind of love that he showed, a love that is forgiving and graceful and yet powerful in weakness. I invite you now to stand and sing with me, Jesus Shall Reign, number 157, in your hymnal and on the screen. of all the nations. 
Help us as Christians to resist the forces of evil and to fight injustice in whatever form we find it. Gracious and generous God, we also pray for all those in need when we in this nation, so many of us, have been blessed with so much. Lord, we lift up all those folks on our prayer list. We ask for special blessings for Jim and Caroline, Dee and Stan Miller, and, and all those who are struggling um, with issues of, of memory loss and dementia. We pray for their caregivers. We pray for all those who are in need of your healing blessing, whether of mind or body or spirit. We know that there are many who, whose spirits are troubled by mental illness, whether it's depression, anxiety, or worse. And we pray that, that they might find the help that they need and find in us friend, friends and support and some encouragers. Lord, in this continuing COVID pandemic, we pray for those who are still struggling with, the, with COVID or, or it's, and for some it's long-term effects. We pray for healing and for an end to this pandemic and for protection from further infection. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon the Exchange Club of Detroit and our, and our own Trenton Exchange Club, but we pray especially that you might help uh, Ira and the board come to, to find a new place for their meetings, and we pray for those who lost their, um, their restaurant or meeting place in that fire, and for all those who have suffered tragic losses like that and who find themselves struggling to figure out how they will go on and how their businesses and their lives will look after having suffered losses. We look to you, Lord, as our, as our Father, as our God, as our Rock, as our Provider, and ask that you bless us and help us as both individuals, as a church, as a nation. And we pray now using the words which your son taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jim will offer the offering prayer. Just a reminder that we're not passing the offering place, but they are in the back of the church. Since our cups run over with the gifts of grace, let us respond with our love and with our gifts. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you that Christ has entrusted us with the task of feeding your people. Make us faithful and courageous in our ministry of love, and may we use these gifts to your glory. Amen.